Um, do you want to bring up the uh, your screen? Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Levy. I am the host for our presentation tonight. It, uh, the, the topic is the status and, pro uh, and prospects for wind in the Great Lakes. Um, it's being presented by John Sarver, who is the former executive director and current secretary of the Great Lakes Renewable Energy Association and former wind energy specialist with the Michigan Energy Office. Um, our uh, meeting tonight is being uh, um, financially underwritten with the um, Department of Energy and uh, Great Lakes and Energy and um, the Environment and um, McNaughton McKay. McKay so, um, so, back one, John, to number two. There we go. Great Lakes uh, Renewable Energy Association was formed in 1991. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization supported by members to educate and advocate for renewable energy in Michigan. Um, next slide, please. There are a number of ways that you can work with us and participate and collaborate with us. One, we have committees and work groups that go on a lot um, in a number of, of areas. You can help grow our membership. Um, and our website is there by renewing your membership and encouraging others to join GLREA, which increases our organization's reach, influence, and ability to uh, um, make things happen on the solar front in Michigan. You can make a financial donation to GLREA to support our work. And for information on any of these above, you can contact John Freeman, who is our esteemed GLREA executive director, and his email is jfreeman13 at comcast.net. Next one. Our Zoom uh, GLREA program, uh, tonight's program, is part of a series of programs that happen each month. The first Thursday of each month, Ann Arbor Solar Stories, uh, hosted by Julie Roth, who's the manager of Solarize Ann Arbor. These are a series of case studies um, on solar installations in Ann Arbor. Um, second Thursday of each month, I do the Renewable Energy Seminar. The third Thursday of each month, we do a Sol Detroit Solar Stories, similar to Ann Arbor in that it's uh, case studies of um, of uh, solar installations in Detroit. And on the fourth Thursday of each month, we do My Solar Stories, which is a Michigan-wide, and also our questions and answers. So, um, our GLREA Renewable Energy Seminar Series covers topics of interest to clean energy users, renewable energy businesses, and advocates. Our seminars include content ranging from technology to business to public policy. It's a Zoom event held each Thursday, as I said. Any questions, uh, you should direct to me at mcleavy123 at gmail.com. We ask that you remember to mute yourself and also please hold our questions until the end of the presentation where you can raise your hand under the reactions button and uh, I'll call on you and you can ask your question uh, of John. Offshore in the Great Lakes. So I wanna welcome you all to this seminar. As I said, John Sarver is our presenter. He's the former executive director and current secretary of GLREA and a former wind energy specialist with the Michigan Energy Office. Since retiring from the Michigan Energy Office, John has continued to serve as GLREA's point person on wind energy policy. At the Michigan Energy Office, John was ground zero for wind development under the Granholm administration. He served as the chairman of the Wind Working Group. He also represented Michigan at the Great Lakes Governors Association, Great Lakes Offshore Wind Council. The prospects for offshore wind energy in the Great Lakes took a direct hit under the Snyder administration. Several important offshore wind projects were terminated. For example, a LIDAR wind assessment uh, project um, with the Grand Valley State University and grant funding secured by the Grand Home Administration was turned back to the U.S. Department of Energy. Michigan's participation in the Great Lakes Governors Association Great Lakes Offshore Wind Council was ended, and most importantly, many Michigan wind companies felt the frosty wind from the Snyder administration and fell on hard times, unfortunately. Snyder supporters who owned expensive lakefront property cheered that lake offshore wind was, uh, was dying quickly. Yet the wind continued to blow in the Great Lakes. Climate change continued to increase. Wind economics continued to dramatically improve. Technology innovation continued, and global wind competition increased. So the worm turns. Tonight, John will give us a status update on the dramatically improved prospects for wind energy in the Great Lakes. John, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to the Great Lake GLREA's Renewable Energy Seminar, and I look forward to your presentation on wind energy. Thanks. Well, thank you, Mark. And 
See if I can make this a little bigger. There we go. Uh, actually, you know, that map uh, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, but you know, the Great Lakes are actually uh, owned by the, uh, the states surrounding the Great Lakes and in Canada, of course. And we being the, the Great Lakes state has a lot of the Great Lakes. And as you can see, that's our, that's our part of it right there. Uh, I'm just going to make a couple comments about wind energy in general, uh, and then kind of uh, drill down to uh, uh, prospects John, of the Great Lakes. John, and, I cannot see it. Oh, you can't see it. Uh, yeah, are others seeing it? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay, that should okay. be my problem then. Thanks. Okay, that should be your problem. Yeah. Oh. Whoops. Let me go back. Uh, uh, just a couple points about wind energy in general. Uh, you know, obstructions cause turbulence. Turbulence is a problem uh, with respect to uh, producing power. As you can see, here's a, a little diagram of a house and a tree. It actually creates a significant amount of turbulence. Hence, you need tall towers. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is, uh, you know, wind speed is basically a factor of the of area that's swept by the blades. So you need the, the bigger the blades, the better. And also, uh, obviously, the wind speed. But the other thing to note is, if you see that formula up there, it's a cube function. And so when you uh, double the uh, wind speed, uh, you're, you're basically cubing the amount of power that's produced. Uh, and that, that's where offshore wind has a number of advantages. There isn't much out there to be a uh, obstruction. Uh, you can actually make... Uh, uh, tower is very tall, wind blades very large uh, out in the, uh, uh, the Great Lakes or in the oceans. Uh, one thing that's happened, uh, yeah, actually for quite a while now, wind is our cheapest uh, resource for generating electricity for new power plants. Certainly uh, any existing power plant is cheaper to operate than a new power plant. But as you can see, uh, wind onshore is the cheapest resource and so solar utility scale is cheap too. And gas combined cycle is competitive. Uh, what you can also see though is coal is no longer competitive in addition to obviously the environmental problems. And nuclear has been actually very expensive for quite a while. Uh, nuclear does have the advantage of not having any greenhouse gases, uh, but the cost and also the, the issue of uh, nuclear waste uh, continue to be problems. Uh, this kind of shows you what's happened in recent history in Michigan. Uh, when we passed uh, the legislation in 2008, uh, utilities immediately started building wind farms. And so most of the additions to uh, our renewable energy resources for electric generation during the past years have been wind. As you can see though, solar is starting to show up in the, the charts and it will become an increasingly larger share of renewable wow. energy in Michigan and mm -hmm. other states too. Uh, wind farms on shore, uh, we've got over 1600 turbines now. They're spread around the state, but obviously there's a big concentration in the Thumb, Huron County and in Gratiot County. Uh, we have a, a concentration. Now, why offshore wind energy? Well, the generation is close to the load. 80% uh, of the population lives near a coast. Uh, there are stronger winds, uh, more consistent winds. Larger scale projects are possible. Uh, we are having issues uh, for onshore wind uh, transportation. As the towers have gotten bigger, blades have gotten bigger. <laughs> And I think everybody has seen those blades running, going down the highway on those trucks. Uh, there, there's a limitation to what you can put on a truck and put on a highway. Well, uh, offshore, you can basically build it on the shore and just kind of uh, tow it out to where you're going to put it. Uh, so larger scale projects are possible, less constrained by transport. And of course, it's a tremendous economic development opportunity for ports and for manufacturing. Now, offshore wind turbines are getting very big. Uh, this one that we see down there is 
12 megawatts. Uh, and you can see the people there. You can see how big it is. The same thing with the blade. Uh, right now, we're talking about uh, 10 megawatt wind turbines in offshore installation, but uh, it won't be too long. 2024, we'll be talking about 12 to 15. And actually, I'm not sure uh, what the limit is for offshore with respect to size of turbines. Uh, obviously, if you can build bigger turbines, you have economies of scale and the costs go down. Now, uh, most of the wind turbines offshore, uh, and most of them are in Europe uh, or China, uh, have been basically in shallower waters where you can basically drive a, a stick in the ground and then put a wind turbine on top of it. Uh, what we're finding though is the floating technology has become feasible. And as you can see, there's three different types of technologies that are used for floating uh, wind turbines. And I think this would be of particular interest to us in Michigan and the Great Lakes. Uh, Lake Erie is very shallow. So that's a, you can still do the traditional uh, construction method, but you start talking about Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, it doesn't take you uh, too long get, getting out from shore before you're in deep water. And so that is a technology has been developing and it's gonna make all the difference in Michigan and, uh, and other parts of the Great Lakes. Um, here's the global status of offshore wind. Uh, we've had over 48,000 megawatts installed. And you, uh, you know we've got about in Michigan, about 9,000 megawatts in our uh, electric grid, just to give you some sense. Uh, the, the project size are, are getting larger like I mentioned, about 99% of the existing ones are fixed bottom in shallow water, but that is changing. Uh, overall costs are declining. Uh, China fairly recently got to the, the top of the list. Uh, Europe has been doing offshore wind for a long time. As you can see, United Kingdom is number two, Germany number three, and I put US in not because they're number four, but just as a reference. Uh, to kind of show where we are compared to uh, uh, other parts of the world. Now, the first offshore wind farm was in Denmark. Denmark has been a, a leader in wind energy. Uh, you can kind of see the map. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, Copenhagen is around there somewhere. Uh, that's, as probably most of you know, just north of Germany. It was erected, the first, one, the first offshore wind farm in 1991, and actually has already been decommissioned for cost reasons because the technology has, has changed so much. The first floating wind farm uh, actually was fairly recently, about five years ago in off of uh, uh, Scotland. And uh, those were uh, five, six megawatts uh, Siemens uh, wind turbines. Uh, so, you know, back when that was happening, of course, six was big. Now we're talking about 10. Down the road, we're going to be talking about 10, 15 megawatts. Now the only actual offshore wind farm in the United States is a small wind farm, 30 megawatts off of Block Island, Rhode Island. Uh, that has been the first one and uh, more, more are coming. Uh, this is all the activity on the East Coast. Uh, actually there's starting to be activity in the Pacific, Gulf of Mexico, uh, but the uh, the East Coast is is kind of the area where uh, there's been the most uh, leasing of lands by the federal oh, government. Uh, and you can kind Thank of you, see, John, John, if you go to the left, uh, you'll see that uh, there's, a, there's a number 31, uh, which is a uh, uh, the Cleveland project, which I'll talk about a little more. Great Lakes wind potential is big. Uh, as a report in March, 2021, uh, one fifth of all the electricity needed by us by 2050 for the Midwest uh, could come from the Great Lakes. And actually for us, it'd be 72% because we got a lot of the Great Lakes as you can see from the map. Uh, and the other states uh, can get less uh, if they want to. Uh, now, this is interesting uh, because there's a uh, uh, some folks out in Stanford uh, uh, 
Mark Jacobson and his crew that have done uh, analyses for all the 50 states and over 100 countries. And basically the analysis was, okay, if we're gonna get to 100% renewable energy uh, for electricity, okay, what would, what would we use by 2050? And so of course, this assumes a lot of things happen. It includes there's a lot of energy efficiency, there's a lot of storage, there's a smart grid, but I thought it was interesting what those smart folks out at Stanford thought. They thought uh, a little hydro, a little wave, solar would be 27%, onshore wind 40%, and offshore wind 31%, almost a third, a third, and a third. And I think uh, most people would be surprised that, you know, of course, this is uh, 40 years from now, but uh, basically these guys were, these folks were predicting uh, uh, 30 years from now, a third of our sure. so wind farms. About four more beans. Let's talk a little about the icebreaker off Cleveland, because this is a, a Great Lakes project that's going to be the first one. Uh, it was first proposed in 2009, so it's been in the works for a while. It would be the first freshwater wind farm in North America. It'd be six turbines, so it'd be kind of a demonstration project uh, eight miles off Cleveland. Uh, cool. It would have good interconnect capacity, abundant winds, large electric demand. It's a shallow area. You know, Cleveland's there and they use a lot of power. Uh, they're hoping that they will become the manufacturing center for offshore wind in the Great Lakes. And that's why the project is small, but they kind of figure they're going to be uh, first out there doing a project in the Great Lakes and the industry with respect to manufacturing. Mm -hmm and installation. And yeah. Now, the, the federal agencies have said there's a limited direct risk to migratory birds, uh, but uh, not all the uh, bird organizations agree with that. The American Bird Conservancy and the Black Swamp Bird Observatory filed a lawsuit in 2019. Now, the environmental community is kind of uh, split because the project is supported by the Sierra Club and Green Energy Ohio and environmental groups, other environmental groups. And uh, uh, basically just yesterday, uh, these uh, American Bird Conservancy had uh, kept appealing uh, the decision that was made for permitting this project. And basically their big issue was that not enough analysis had been done uh, with respect to the impact on, on birds and that uh, therefore the project should be uh, halted and the uh, developers should go back to the drawing board and do a more in-depth analysis. Well, the Ohio Supreme Court just ruled yesterday, six to one, to approve the permit. And basically they said for this project, uh, the analysis was done, uh, was adequate. Now, we back uh, when Granholm was governor, uh, we, she established the Michigan Grid, Great Lakes Wind Council. And uh, this actually uh, work that was done back, uh, those, that's what, 12 years ago now, uh, actually will be very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, it basically looked at the various areas and identified uh, five priority areas that uh, using a variety of screening criteria would be the best locations uh, for offshore wind in the Michigan territorial waters. So uh, some analysis has been done. Uh, what's important too is that there were recommendations on the, uh, the whole legislative framework and the permitting framework that would need to be done in order to do this. Nothing in law now about permitting uh, large wind turbines in our Great Lakes. So they, they came up with some recommendations. Uh, they, they basically suggested that we would offer certain parcels within the five priority areas at a competitive public auction. And the, uh, the report, the council basically uh, suggested permitting guidelines and leasing methods and payment structures. So they went into some detail about uh, how, how we could uh, actually manage the process of uh, uh, permitting uh, wind farms in, in our Great Lake areas. And they had a proposed process for public input, which is very important. 
Uh, a big issue uh, for offshore wind is visual impact. And this gives you a sense for what you can see from about uh, nine miles out. You can see them, they're not real big. Um, I'm thinking, uh, you know, what's gonna happen is that, uh, you know, you're gonna go even farther out than 10 miles. Uh, and use yeah. the floating here, technology. Where all the birds are not getting uh, But there's a. Can you ask me about muting? Can you leave us, please, Ellen, Ellen Link. Are you. Muted? Sure. There you go. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, a few issues. Fish, of course, is an issue. Okay. Uh, like onshore uh, wind farms, you need, you need site specific analysis and monitoring. Uh, you need to avoid migration and spawning areas, uh, endangered or threatened fish. There's issues related from noise from construction, but of course, the construction is a short-term uh, issue. Uh, but they do things like limiting vessel speeds to cut down on the noise. Uh, some of the projects use a curtain of air bubbles around construction sites to muffle the, the noises. Uh, operating wind turbines produce some auto underwater noise, uh, but it's, it's fairly, uh, fairly low. Uh, one thing they found in Europe is that the turbine foundations can actually be artificial reefs, reefs and habitat for fish, uh, which is a plus. Uh, birds, yes, uh, especially in the Great Lakes with all the, the migratory birds we have. Again, site-specific assessment. Uh, Europe, Europeans have perfected methodologies for uh, doing these sorts of surveys and monitoring. Of course, you got to worry about endangered species. And there is a Migratory Bird Act with Canada. So, uh, uh, you know, there are very specific requirements with respect to uh, not harming uh, migratory birds. Now, the biggest challenge Europe has faced is actually displacing birds from their preferred area. And that is a, a negative environmental impact. A surface ice, uh, it, that's an issue in the Great Lakes, uh, although we're getting less surface uh, winter surface, surface ice uh, as climate change has its impact. Uh, but as you can see, uh, the maximum, at least historically, winter ice cover uh, for Lake Michigan has been 93%. And so they've had to design a cone around the wind turbines that will basically uh, deflect the ice so it doesn't damage the turbines, the towers. Uh, this is my last slide. And it basically, this is kind of my personal opinion. You know, we, the US, the uh, Biden administration has set ambitious climate targets, net zero carbon emissions by 2050, 100% carbon free power by 2035. And in order to achieve this, offshore wind will be critical. And uh, <clears throat> one thing that's interesting about uh, having a lot of wind farms is that during times when you have excess production, you can use it actually to produce hydrogen, which can be very useful in uh, meeting the energy needs of industry and uh, you know large ships, uh, airplanes. Now the uh, there's global impacts from climate change. Okay, there's obviously site-specific impacts on the environment from wind turbines, whether they're onshore or offshore. Uh, I think if we have a, a good analysis and a, a good uh, selection process citing these, uh, we can basically mitigate both. And, and that's it. I'd be glad to answer any questions. I guess, Mark, you wanna... Uh, uh, sure. I can. I, I'll start off questions. Um, I I remember doing um, analysis on bird migration and bird issues associated with onshore wind, and um, one of the definitive studies looked at it and said that you know birds can tell when they're coming upon a a um, wind farm or a wind machine and and move around it, but oftentimes. They get caught inside the field, the packing dense field, and get get confused inside the field. Um, whereas offshore wind, the turbines are spread farther apart, and that's not not as big as a problem. Do you does that resonate? What do you think? That, that was the, my reading. Is that true? 
Well, I, I, I think it uh, depends, uh, like like a lot of things, right? Depends, I think, on maybe the types of birds. Uh, I, I remember, though, it was interesting. Uh, it seems like a, it was a, a decade ago. <laughs> I was in Toledo at a conference, and the Europeans right. were showing this video. Uh, and they basically, uh, you know, these birds were heading to this huge wind farm in the uh, North Sea. And once they got close to it, they just kind of spread apart and went around it. Now, apparently not all birds are that smart. And I think, Mark, you make a good point that uh, how uh, the wind farms are uh, designed uh, right. can make a difference. Right. And, and right. there are now technologies to... Uh, um, kind of uh, discourage birds and bats too from getting close to wind turbines. So the, the industry is working with uh, both the uh, wildlife folks, basically. There's a separate institute uh, for wind and wildlife that's trying to, uh, there is going to be some, some impact regardless, uh, but the, the whole idea is to minimize the impact. Uh, and uh, most of the environmental groups support the, the wind uh, farms basically because they perceive climate change as a, as a bigger threat than the kind of site-specific environmental impacts. But, uh, uh, you know, so uh, the, the important thing is that a good analysis be done by the wind developer and that there be monitoring. Um, Charles, you're up. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is a two a two parter. Uh, but one is that the first part, simple one. I I remember back in the day that if you look on the wind you know wind potential maps that east of the Mississippi, Michigan was number one. I think we we're fourteenth in the country. But if you factor in the Great Lakes with their class six winds, we might be to have the most wind potential of any state if you factor in you know the offshore oh. winds. That's that's uh, just asking for comment on that and I'll just bring you the second question is you had back in the day you had you know the uh, the grand home as you mentioned the grand home administration was very uh promoting you know uh, the potential offshore winds you know you had your head up that that group there in the state with a lot of uh, state approval what what's the lay of the land in 2022 with the Whitmer administration are there companies or other folks that are really pushing this I mean where are we what's where where what's what is the What's the landscape looking like at the moment? Uh, as, as far as I know, and I kind of am in the lookout for information, uh, in Michigan and actually all of the Great Lakes states in Canada too, nothing is happening with respect to offshore wind. Uh, now there is the Cleveland project. And so everybody I think is kind of uh, seeing how that goes because when you get involved with the project uh, in the Great Lakes, uh, you're talking about the Army Corps of Engineers, lots of state agencies, federal agencies. So it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, I remember one meeting we had back in the day where we basically uh, called together all the state and federal agencies, uh, and there were about 30 people in the room. And the question yeah. we, we asked everybody was, uh, uh, what do you think are the issues? And people go, oh, let's see. And so we did a little brainstorming. And so there's a lot of people involved. And, uh, you know, the reality is that uh, uh, we still have uh, land for both onshore wind farms and solar arrays. Now that's becoming more of an issue, I think, with uh, some local opposition to uh, both sorts of renewable sources. Uh, I, I think we'll see a lot of activity on the East Coast, and uh, part of that, well, we are seeing a lot of activity on the East Coast, oh, yeah. uh, part of that is because uh, electricity is more expensive and land is more scarce. And so if, you know, if you're in New York City, putting it offshore or Boston or, you know, Virginia, it, it makes a heck of a lot more sense than uh, in the Great Lakes. It's coming to the Great Lakes, though. It's just a matter of time. Um, well, it sounds like it has come to the Great Lakes, John. It's a, what, the one in Cleveland. I mean, it's the first one. Right. Um, it, okay, my you know, question. It's, it's great. My other question <laughs> was about uh, the potential, the first question. Is that true that we have the most, if you took the fact in the Great Lakes, we have the most potential of any state as far as uh, off, offshore wind, as, 
Yeah, that's, I think though, that's, that's deceptive. I tell you why, because, uh, you know, we have the Great Lakes, like I mentioned earlier, are owned for all of us by the states. Okay, when you get out into the oceans, you know, all those wind farms that are being put in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, that's federal territory. And so that those, all that wind power that's being developed on the Atlantic isn't counted toward Virginia, you know, Massachusetts and what. So I think uh, maybe technically as a state, we, we have tremendous potential, but uh, there's a lot of wind potential out there in federal waters. So it's, I think that's, that was a little misleading, but. Okay, uh, if my screen keeps jumping around, it looks like, I think Matt Selmer, Matt, I think you're up next. Thank you, I've got a couple of questions. Well, the first one would be, what kind of ship is required to erect the wind turbines and is that ship available on the Great Lakes versus the ocean? That, well, yeah, and there's, that's an excellent question. There, there's uh, uh, the, the traditional way of uh, uh, sticking wind turbines in, into the ground in, in the lakes. Okay, there's a specific sort of boat or ship that's kind of, uh, you jack it up and then you kind of pile drive and then put the wind turbine on top. Now that doesn't work with floating wind turbines, of course, you know, basically you're towing them out and then you're anchoring them to the bottom of the lake. A, a big issue, which is really uh, complicates things is there's a, uh, a federal law that requires only U ship, United States ships in United States crews be used uh, in our domestic waters. Right. And so uh, that means that we have to build new boats uh, or they have to find loopholes. Uh, we can't even use Danish crews or German crews who may have all the experience for doing this sort of work. Uh, and that is a major uh, issue, both the availability of the boats, the ships, and uh, whether they have to be U.S. ships and U.S. crews. So that's all kind of being, I, I, don't, I don't know how that's going to work out. Okay. Another question I have is, what is the maintenance requirement? You, you showed a picture of a 10 megawatt uh, turbine. You said they're getting larger yet. Is the, the maintenance, I mean, it, someone's got to climb up on that stick and change the oil in that turbine at some frequency. Right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, now one one thing that, yeah, that's a now you know some people love to do that. Uh, oh, really? I guess. Uh, although I I got a kick out of Kalamazoo Valley Community College has a uh, they actually train wind turbine technicians, and one of the yeah. first things they do is they have the the students climb to the top of the tower, and they lose about a third of the class. <laughs> Absolutely. They, they, a third of them go oh. because it's not just a matter of climbing up the ladder. Okay, you got to climb up with your tools. You got to be prepared if there's an injury up there that somebody's going to have to somehow get somebody down who's injured. Uh, it's the, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's a, uh, now what's happening too is the uh, uh, drones and other sorts of automated uh Electronic devices are being used to monitor, uh, and so some of the labor is being kind of uh, automated. Uh, but still, hey, you got to be a wind turbine technician, yeah, whether it's onshore or offshore. You know, offshore you got to take a boat out there. <laughs> onshore you drive there, but then you got to climb up, and that's now. I, I did run into one uh, wind turbine in Michigan that had an elevator. And I don't know this for a fact, but I'm guessing that uh, with those really tall towers out in the ocean in the lake, that they have elevators. But I, I don't know that for a fact because uh, uh, they're pretty tall. Right. Thank All you. right, Matt. If you have any questions, uh, why don't you come in and come back up? I will. Person Clayton Cox, you want to step up and speak? Questions? Yep. Uh, I have a question. And the question is, can offshore wind turbines be installed in areas like 
Florida on the Gulf Coast, to be the Gulf of Mexico, where there are hurricanes. So, so the big question is dealing with hurricanes. Yeah, I'm just a little familiar with that issue, just having read some things. And of course, you know, we've got uh, obviously a lot of oil, oil uh, platforms down there. And uh, but it is an issue. And uh, and uh, uh, so uh, it, my understanding is that it can be dealt with because they're talking about leasing areas in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, yeah. And I'm not sure uh you know at what point do they kind of uh, how they shut things down and what they do i'm not sure about the the actual mechanics of it but the fact that they're talking about leasing areas in the gulf of mexico means that somebody thinks that they can survive the hurricanes um yeah john those floating turbines are, are basically oil rigs with a with a uh a, a turbine you know tower and a blade on top of them. They're, they're, they have um, big propellers underneath that are always constantly moving and, and adjusting the, uh, the uh, floating uh, oil rig all, at all times. Um, that's, that, that's what happens when they have a fire and they lose power. That's what happens when the, the rig goes out. So my sense of what I understand is that the floating ones um, are actually better in the, in the Gulf than the, the stable ones because they literally can move um and you know feather into the wind and, and stuff like that and they also tip over and spill wind um so so you you maybe move your maybe move out across. of the path of the hurricane at least the, the worst part yeah, yeah well they adjust right. yeah yeah all right steven how about you yeah hi yeah thanks mark um yeah and thanks for the presentation john that was very interesting um, my question was just about the slide where um, uh, your there was a summary of the October 2010, 2010 report from the Granholm administration about siting, you know, about preferential siting things. And I presume that that was done um, not considering uh, floating wind farms. Is that correct? And if so, then um, that would need to be updated. And is that part of the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan? To redo that study, you know, considering that there is the possibility of doing floating. Uh, to my knowledge, it's not part of the plan. Uh, I'd be surprised if it was part of the plan, but I, I don't know actually. Uh, but you're right. I mean, uh, that report was done in 2010. Uh, back in 2010, I think there was maybe, maybe even not back then, one lone turbine out in the North Sea that the Norwegians had out there that was floating. So the, in the economics, the technology has changed. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it should be looked at. Uh, I think though the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan is probably focused on more short-term uh, actions that mm -hmm. can be taken. Uh, because yeah, nobody's, uh, everybody's kind of watching to see what's going on in Cleveland and the Atlantic Ocean, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's there's a lot to do with respect to climate uh, change. I mean, lots of efficiency and renewables and electric vehicles. So uh, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I'd be surprised if it's a part of that effort. Okay, yeah, thanks. Jay, how about you? Your question, Jay? Oh. Uh, yeah. Okay. First, uh, first, I wanted to point out that um, now this is a few years back. A uh, wind uh, farm that was being built in the Thumb area near Unionville, Michigan, uh, was giving tours. They were free tours. You got to see uh, 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 close up and sometimes even inside uh, the wind turbines. I don't know if mm -hmm. they're still giving these tours, but that was an excellent and very informative uh, thing to do. But uh, my question is, uh, with every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So uh, <laughs> as the wind uh, blows across the turbine, you're extracting energy, which, of course, now the wind has uh, slowed down. Uh, so has anyone, is anyone doing studies where they study the before and after, before the wind turbines are installed, and then after the wind turbines are installed, any effects on, say, wave action within the lakes 
or uh, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, microclimates that uh, take place. Um, any any sort of studies being done in that regard to make to, to see what the long term effects may be. Yeah, there are studies that have been done. I don't think the the studies though are are based on actual data. I think the studies that I've read about are actually based on modeling. Uh, you know, and and this and of course like. Like a lot of academic studies, you know, there are different conclusions drawn depending on, uh, I guess, the researcher and modeling. So, so they, there are uh, researchers looking at that issue, um, but as far as I know, it's it like I said, it's a, a modeling, uh, like a lot of climate. I mean, basically, climate change predictions based yeah. on sophisticated models. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, you're right. If you have enough wind turbines, uh, it it can have an impact. I haven't read anywhere though that it would have a, a, a huge impact. Uh, probably a bigger impact is, uh, especially on wind farms, is uh, just the uh, changes we have in our climate. Uh, mm -hmm. That will be, uh, you know, as the temperatures change, uh, wind patterns may change too. And, and you know, the, uh, the force of the wind. So uh, that's, a, that's a, something also being looked at and studied. So it, it may not be even discernible because of the signal to noise ratio effectively of the environment. Okay, thank you very much. Well, there was a lot of studies done, uh, Jay, on turbulence of wind. Um, in, in other words, um, the turbulence coming off a of wind, one wind machine, does that turbulence affect the wind uh, of the machines around it, especially specifically behind it, but also, you know, how, how far away does another machine have to be so that the turbulence doesn't, doesn't uh, disrupt its power. And there's a lot of work. So, you know, I think also a wind and a wind machines only carving out, you know, a, a circular a part of that and the rest of the wind is, is moving at the same speed around it. So, I think you raised interesting questions. I'd encourage you to go look at some of the turbulence studies that have been done, because that would probably give you more of an idea of what's what's happening with the with the wind from the the you know from the wind machines and and people who put up wind farms are very concerned about turbulence because they don't want the power to drop because um, one machine's too close to another. Okay, and thank a, you. And a different issue that's come up for uh, both solar and wind is recycling. Uh, we're, we're at the point where uh, basically there are solar panels and wind turbines and blades that are uh, uh, being taken down. And the issue is how can we recycle, recycle them? Right. How can they be used? Uh, how can you get the valuable materials out of solar panels? I just read recently that the, the first uh, uh, blade that was really designed to be completely yeah. recycled, wind turbine blade, was just recently installed because the wind yeah. turbine, uh, the uh, wind turbine blades are are not an easy thing to kind of recycle because it's composite materials, you know, and, and solar panels do have issues because of the way they're built, uh, being able to get all the materials and uh, uh, you know out of them. But the industry the industry is working on that, and uh, they are trying to design solar panels and. Uh, wind blades that are uh, could be more easily recycled. Um, of course, the towers and stuff, you know, steel, it's that's a, not a, a difficult thing to recycle. And actually with solar panels, the uh, the glass and the aluminum framing and stuff, that's not hard to recycle either. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So we have a we have a, a person who's sort of a, a star here for us because some of the early wind machines that went up um, Charles Morris is a Reverend Charles Morris. And those of you who know Reverend Charles Morris, and Charles actually crawled up a wind machine and blessed one of the first wind machines that went up. Charles, you want to regale us with that story? <laughs> well, I don't know. The only well, the only thing I did was I, I um, when the um, those wind turbines went up in Mackinac, Mackinac City, I think yeah. they were first, oh, next to Traverse City, they were the first ones. And Rich Vanderveen asked me to come up and I, I. Uh, I, uh, you went, yeah, we did a, a, a blessing, and uh, I, I know he made the remark about some lightning hit, and I said, well, what do you think would happen if they weren't blessed, hadn't been blessed? So, and the irony was I, had a, I was taking a renewable energy class with Deborah Rowe, 
that night, that day, and I drove down from there, Mackinac City, to Royal Oak for class for my class, and she was on, she was all going about the, uh, you know, about the the the, the uh, about the, these new wind turbines going on. And I said, yeah, I, I just blessed them today. So, but and then I did another one for Rich up in the one of the wind farms near up uh, what's the name? Uh, not near St. Louis, uh, Michigan. You know that that big wind farm. I I did the blessing there too. Yeah. Plus plus Love my own. Now, and, and have you done a careful uh, statistical analysis to determine how much production has been increased? Or, or lightning <laughs> strikes? There have been no lightning strikes on yours. The ones who were blown. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Any other questions or observations? John Freeman, you got any other things about the the idea of what prospects for wind with the the current governor and your insights to what's happening with the Clean Michigan Plan. What do you think? I don't really have any insights. Um, I, I haven't heard, just like John has said, I haven't heard much talk at all about it. Um, I, think, I think the issue of visual pollution is still out there. And a lot of people mm -hmm. have cottages in Michigan along the water. And so I think... Yeah governor whether it's republican or democrat is always going to have those issues um but i think i think like john indicated i think the lake lake erie example i think all the governors will be looking at that and seeing uh and here's a question john does the company that owns the wind turbine in lake erie pay property taxes Oh, you know, I don't know. That's a good question. You know, because tax benefits are always a sweetener yeah. for local units of government to, to take on opposition or a state for that matter. So that's always one of the, the curious things. And, and DTE has recently resolved a series of court cases up in the thumb area about the, the property taxes of the wind turbines up there. So well, you know, it's it's uh, state waters, uh, and so yeah, I'm right. guessing the way it works is that uh, nobody uh, gets a permit to put anything in the water without yeah. providing some sort of revenue. And I'm right. guessing, and I'm just guessing that then the state shares some of that revenue with the local governments. But that's that's a guess. Yeah. I know I do know though when Michigan talked about the whole permitting issue. Yeah, there was a lot of discussion about, okay, how much are we going to charge? Because these are our waters, and we're not going to let somebody put a big wind farm out there without uh, basically charging them. How far, right. John, is the is the Port Huron Mackinac race, or Chicago race? Would that be a problem at all? Uh, well, not unless somebody isn't paying attention. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you know, it, it is a... It, it it is an issue if uh, people are drinking too much and don't look where they're going. Yeah, but uh, hopefully people are are smarter than that because okay. uh, I mean, and uh, I, I do know there are navigation channels uh, for uh, commercial shipping, uh, and uh, but I mean sailboats they go all over the place, right? And uh, but you'd have to be pretty oblivious though to not see a big wind turbine out in a lake. I mean that's pretty big. So, of course, that's what the wind is, right? So, hey, uh, Abraham, Ben, respect you. Have, you're up. You have a question. I uh, wonder whether uh, any of the uh, federal, uh, current federal uh, packages uh, had funding for wind energy of any kind. Yes, there is yeah, something yeah. in the, the recent legislation uh, related to uh, offshore wind. I, I haven't actually read the specifics, but there is something there that's going to uh, encourage. Uh, I think it has to do with uh, maybe uh, Florida, uh, all sorts of wind or energy development right. was uh, not permitted off of Florida and maybe some other states. And I think the new legislation says no you, you can do energy development out there but now that would include oil gas wind well they are, they're going to restore the wind energy credit and the solar credit too or i i understand oh. being restored so um, That's, yeah. so the, they'll be i don't know if it's different for offshore versus onshore but the that wind credit will 
it's going to be stored and it's going to be locked up uh, guaranteed for 10 years so it's going to provide some stability is that true john, for uh, residential solar as well john uh, you may know that answer that question they they're supposed to restore the wind and solar credit are they taking it back to its original so it's going to be a 30 percent tax credit on solar and whatever the wind was or is it a new is it from where it is now no absolutely it's going to be it's going to be 30 percent for 10 years okay so then it is That's the, the investment tax, tax credit so yeah. So no, it'll be it'll be it will be fantastic, you know, because okay. it was slated to go to twenty two percent January first, and uh, so this is a very major, a major positive development. So wind will do the same. Then. Excellent. Any other questions? Any other questions? Any any update on uh, the uh, DTE rate case? <laughs> No, Abraham, we're still in the we're still in the case. We filed our brief and we're going to be filing a reply brief soon. But there is a public hearing in downtown Detroit yeah. on, on August 22nd at the Wayne County Community College at 1001 West Fort Street that is specifically about this case. And so if you're interested in driving down there to join us, we'd love to have you. All of you. Yes, please. Unfortunately, I'm uh, way out of the state. <laughs> Time okay. zones out of the state. So sorry. We'd love to be there. Well, John Tarver, you want to do any concluding remarks? Uh, no, I, I, I guess I'll just say there's, there's uh, like any sort of new development, there's lots of issues to consider. I, I think because of the Great Lakes Wind Council we had, we're in some ways, uh, ahead of a lot of the other states uh, yeah. and it is coming. I don't think it's gonna be next week or next year, but uh, offshore wind is is almost uh, gonna happen for sure, I think, because it's a, it's a valuable resource. And uh, as, as long as we can get far out from those cottages on Lake Michigan, uh, we'll be all set. You know, I mean, we gotta get out there 15 miles or something or at least over 10. So uh, nobody, uh, uh, complains about the uh, visual impact. Okay. Oh, it looks like Jay's got another question. Jay? Uh, more comment. Uh, my wife and I every year do the 127 yard sale trail that runs down 127 from Addison, Michigan, all the way to Alabama. We never get out of Ohio. We, we, we take multiple days and never make it out of Ohio. But anyway, along that route, 127, down in Ohio is a large wind farm. And every year I go and ask the, uh, the folks uh, putting on their garage sales uh, along the path um, uh, how the wind uh, turbines uh, have affected their lives. And, uh, you know, one, uh, you know, anybody got any cancer? And no, 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 they don't have cancer. Um, anybody have an, an, an abundance of bird, deaths of uh, birds and bird carcasses in your fields? Nobody has noticed any change in, in bird strikes. Um, it all boiled down to um, uh, one elderly woman who didn't like the wind turbines because she says they squeak. And I found that rather uh, 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 probably not true because if anything squeaks on a wind turbine, they're going to oil it. Yeah. Really. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, she did, uh, I have to qualify that. She was one of the only neighbors in an entire area that didn't, did not have a wind turbine on her property. They didn't offer her the deal. So she wasn't getting any money, so of course she's poo-pooing it. However, the only complaint that anybody had was the the sudden shadow flickering through their wind or windows uh, in yeah. the morning hours and the evening hours. And they said, you know, when you're getting all this money to go in and rent this land, the cost of a, of a blackout blind is nothing. So uh, they have learned yeah. to go and have blackout blinds on the east side of their house in the mornings and on the west side of their house in the evenings, and they live with it because it is a profitable deal for them. So that was the only negative I heard from any of the people that I interviewed about wind turbines. They love them. They find them to be graceful giants, and their and their money in their in their uh, coffers to help keep their farms alive. Thank you.
Yeah, I, I remember when I was doing the wind stuff. Thing, you know, that the wind machines and what they said was basically, yeah, the wind machines block our view of the sunset. And I made some comment about, you know, uh, what is it about? You like the sun, uh, sunset so much? Oh, it's the beautiful red colors and stuff like that. And I said, well, do you know what makes those colors? You know, and explain to her the, the pollution, the methane and stuff. I said, so, you know, that color is what the planet looks like when it's bleeding from over pollution. So, you know, the, you're, you're, at least you're getting a chance to block it with, with the wind. And every time the wind goes around, you know, the planet gets healthier. And uh, it was an interesting response. I'm not sure it sunk in, but it certainly felt good saying it. <laughs> anyway, Abraham, you got another question, comment? Yeah, I just wonder what happens to uh, uh, local property taxes when uh, one has a wind farm on a piece of property in Michigan. Yep. Does the local community raises those uh, taxes or is that uh, included in the exclusions, uh, let's say, of the, uh, of the, the solar? Uh, arrangement. The uh, the uh, wind farms uh, are tremendous uh, help tremendously with respect to rural areas. The tax revenue. Uh, I remember seeing a statistic that the uh, this is just like the first wind farm in Gratiot County, or the first wind farms uh, were greater than the next ten uh, uh, tax payers in the whole county. So I mean, it was a tremendous boon to. Uh, Gratiot County and that because you know a lot of rural areas don't have very big tax bases and it's a it's a, a big a big asset right. and it's also big created asset. a lot of jobs in the rural parts of the state too it gives young people something to aspire to and then he maybe even stick around the rural parts of the state because they can find work now Well, let me take a moment thanks. to talk about thanks. it. Next month. First of all, I want to thank John for a great presentation and uh, all of you who came on. Next month, we are going to have a presentation by a uh, new solar venture that's happening in Michigan. McNaughton McKay is one of the largest uh, solar uh, contractors in the state. They've um, worked on uh, uh, individual um, residential uh, operations like my house, and they have also put up large wind farms for utilities. Um, and uh, they are an employee-owned corporation in Ann Arbor that was got traces of their founding all the way back to the 1800s. Um, they have formed a joint venture with a German-Swedish firm called Meyer Berger. Uh, Meyer Berger was a, a builder of um, solar photovoltaic manufacturing plants for others. They have developed uh, um, uh, tremendous expertise in, in creating high volume uh, manufacturing of, of high output solars um, and they have a, a heterogeneous junction technology um, that they're they're using um, and ultra pure silicon uh, to get high efficiency solar cells um, at, uh, at extremely extremely high quality two plants manufacturing plants now they're moving into the commercial side of this thing they're running their own plants they built two in Germany they're building two in Michigan or two in the United States now, one in Georgia, and they have reached out and formed a, um, a joint venture with McNaught and McKay. So McNaught and McKay and Meyer Berger will be uh, announcing and launching uh, this new venture in Michigan. They'll have available starting in October and in September, they'll be on this uh, Renewable Energy Seminar to talk about their partnership, this new venture and what it means for Michigan. So I invite you to all come back then and uh, get an update on, on what's happening in solar. And as John said, with the new 30 cent tax credit going back um, and uh, you know, leading solar firms moving back into Michigan to capitalize in this market, I think we're gonna see some really sunny times ahead of us. So it's, it's good stuff. So I thank you all. John Freeman, you got a closing remark? No, I just wanna thank all the GLREA members for joining us and for your support for the organization and the work we're doing. And if anybody is not a member, we encourage you to join and, and be a part of the family. So we appreciate all your support.